fiction, science fiction, horror, fantasy, crime, LGBT, thriller. You have now entered the house of mystery with your hosts, Eric Shapiro, David North Martino. John Copenhaver and Al Warren. Heard on KCB 106.5 FM Los Angeles. 102.3 FM Riverside. And 105.0 AM Palm Springs. All right, everybody, we are back in the House of Mystery. You're being joined today by your host, Kevin Thompson, and, as usual, my beautiful co-host, Julie Saville. Hiya. <laughs> Al will not be joining us today as he has taken the day off. So, whew. Yeah, <laughs> a, a, a lot of, he has a lot of faith in us, Julie. <laughs> I know, I know. We are, we are like children left to play alone. <laughs> yes, yes, the nanny is not here. But, yeah, well. but we've got a lot to talk about today, guys. We are being joined by Lisa Espich. Lisa, welcome. Welcome to the show. Thank you, Julie and Kevin. Thanks so much for having me on. Oh, who could turn this down? You know, um, Serial Killers is right down our alley. So, <laughs> so be before we actually get in into the works, tell us a little bit about yourself and, and you know, what life's journey brought you here to this point? Well, I live here in Tucson, Arizona, and I've lived here my whole life. My father was a close friend with the serial killer, Charles Schmidt. Of course, at the time, he didn't know he was a serial killer. But my father was the one who was the star witness for the prosecution. He's the one that went to the police and and told them what was going on and blew the whistle on the whole thing. My father wrote his side of the story in 1967, but not knowing what to do with it at that time, he just boxed it away. And about 10 years ago, which was about 40 years after he wrote it, my sisters and I were going through old boxes of photos and old paperwork with my mother and came across the manuscript, which we did not know existed. I was very intrigued, went home and read it, and was really blown away by the manuscript he had written. And not knowing that much about the cases, even though it was my father, I was really shocked at just how involved he was in all of this. And we right away tried to encourage him to share his side of the story. Um, initially, he was shocked that we had found the manuscript, and I think he didn't think it existed anymore and just wanted it back. Mm -hmm. But eventually, over time, things kept coming up, especially here in Tucson, that would always bring the Charles Schmidt cases back up all the time. And that was always frustrating for him because they didn't always get the facts right, and they always portrayed him in a real over-the-top way. And we uh, finally were able to encourage him to share his side of the story and and let people know how he got so involved and and how this all came about for him. Lisa, just rewinding a moment, because that's massive. That is absolutely huge, going into a loft and then suddenly finding out about your father's almost hidden identity where he had protected you girls from all of those things. It's true. Yeah, we really didn't know much about it. After reading the book and looking and researching the cases, I was actually surprised that we never really looked further into it because this is our father and we knew he was connected, but pretty much we knew he was a friend of Charles Schmidt and we knew that he was the one that went to the police. But in reading his story, uh, it's, it's much more involved than that. And he was so much more involved in the cases than I ever knew. And, yeah, they really did keep us uh, protected from all that information. Wow. Now, now when you say that he was it, it, very, very involved, was this kind of like a, a diary of his friendship, or was this like post-capture and, and here's my part in it? So it was written after... The, he was arrested, and it was written during the trials. And he really wrote this because at the time, because my father was so close with Charles Schmidt, 
And because it did take a little time for my father to come forward, there was a lot of questions and speculation when it came to my father. And the media attention was really negative. And he was portrayed as, you know, possibly being more involved in the actual murders than he was. As a and there suspect? Was a, yeah, so a lot of people treated him as if he had done something wrong or was involved in the murders, which was not the case. And so I, I believe he wrote in detail so that his side of the story could be understood, but it's written very much in a, a memoir diary type of, of format where you really get to understand how he really felt going through this. It, he does a really great job of taking you into his emotions through all of this, and you really get to understand how a young man could get you know, so caught up with this friendship that he did have a difficult time coming forward right away. What was the purpose of, of he at the time of him writing the manuscript? Again, I believe it was his just trying to get his side of the story out. He, at the time, he really was hoping that somebody would publish that so that people could understand his side because really all that was put out there was speculation and and a lot of questions, but nobody was really asking him for answers. And so I believe he was writing it as his way to get his story out there. Of course, this was 1967, and back then, you know, it's not that easy to get something published, where nowadays, even if you want to self-publish, you could do that. But back then, he didn't know what to do with the writing once he was done, and ready to move on with his life, he just boxed it up and, and kind of tried to move past it. Yeah, because if he's trying to explain his parts in it, yet he never released it. And that really doesn't make sense. And again, it's because he just didn't know what to do with it. You know, back then you had your, you know, probably four or five main publishers, and he did submit his manuscript um, to be published, but of course he didn't have an agent. He wasn't uh, a known writer, and a lot of people had already written books and articles on it, and so even though this was his inside account, and you would think that they would want that insider's account, uh, there was John Gilmore, who was a big author who's now passed, but he, his book had just recently published at that time. And so there was a lot of stuff already written out there, and of course a lot of it um, didn't have the true facts that he lived. And so it's it's been... 50 years since the cases, and now for the first time, his true side is, is being shared. Because, you know, it left a lot to speculation. It, in fact, this very crime, you know, the, the Pied Piper of Tucson, has even made it to the Tucson Murders True Crime Tours. Yes, that is true. There is a, there is a Pied Piper of Tucson tour here in Tucson. How accurate would you say that... that tour is and i'm not trying to disparage the tour but you know given what you know is it would it be fairly accurate well so i've actually gone on the tour and uh what i can tell you is the the man who does the tour has done an amazing amount of research and so the tour really is about taking you to all of the different locations and and he has a lot of of the facts and the locations down, much more than I would have ever known or, or even my family knew because he has done so much research on every single person that's been involved in these cases. So the, the tour is very uh, factually correct, and uh, but he, he goes more into, he, he literally takes you to all of the different locations throughout Tucson, uh, the homes of of the mafia that were involved and the families, everything. Uh, and, and see, and that was a free plug. So you're welcome to this on Murder <laughs> Tour. <laughs> so, so let's talk a little bit about Charles Schmidt himself. Um, first of all, I, I've got to ask, how did the name the Pied Piper of Tucson, what is that? I mean, you know, as as a fan of true crime and, and the paranormal, I mean that that just that just reeks of intrigue. Right. Uh, Life magazine did an article right after Charles Schmidt was arrested, and so right before the trials, 
And that's really when it became huge national news. But they did a whole feature on uh, Charles Schmidt and the murders. And the man who wrote the article, Don Moser, is the man who wrote the article for Life magazine. He's the one that labeled Charles Schmidt the Pied Piper of Tucson. And the reason he gave him that nickname is because Charles Schmidt had a huge following here in Tucson. He had a way of just getting teenagers to really follow him and keep his secrets. And so the first murder that happened, Charles Schmidt got two other teenagers to actually do that murder with him. This was prior to Charles Manson, and so at that time, no one really had heard of a young man like this getting other teenagers to kill with him. And so it really, he was labeled that because of his ability to get followers and to get teenagers to keep his secrets and do things with him. How many uh, victims? There are three victims that we know of. Um, there was one young girl who was 15, which was in 1964. A year later, it was two sisters, one who Charles Schmidt was dating and her younger sister. There is a fourth girl that came up missing right in that si same time frame. And there's speculation that he was involved in that murder or he was the murder of that girl, but there was never any evidence of that. And uh, she was believed to be a runaway by the police. But there is speculation that there was a fourth murder. And my father even writes in his book that Charles Schmid told him that he had murdered four times, but he never got into any details of that fourth murder. So how did... What was the pattern there of the murder? What was the pattern? How did he prefer to murder? So the first girl that they murdered, Aline Rowe, in 1964, was really just because Charles Schmidt wanted to see what it was like to kill somebody. He wanted to murder a girl, and he convinced his friend, John Saunders, to do this with him. And Charles Schmidt had a girlfriend at that time, Mary French, that... John and Charles had come up with a list of names of girls that would be possible victims, mm -hmm. and they narrowed it down just randomly to Aline Rowe, and Aline Rowe just lived a few houses away from Mary French, and so they knew each other from the neighborhood, and Mary French convinced Aline Rowe to come out one night to go out with Charles and John. Uh, they had her believing that they were just going to go out to drink beer in the desert, which was not uncommon at that time to have a desert party. And so I don't think Aline Rowe had any idea that she was walking into any sort of trouble. And uh, they, Mary French stayed in the car, but John and Charles uh, took her down into a wash and raped and murdered her. They hit her over the head with a large rock and murdered her. Mm -hmm. And then they all uh, buried her and covered it up. So, okay, now I was reading earlier, sorry, Kev, I was reading earlier, um, I think it might have been on a Wikipedia link, so we all know that Wikipedia can be great and not. Yes. So, but it does say that um, there is speculation that when she went missing, her father told her mother that he felt she had been murdered. Yes, so the, the mother and father both felt that she had been murdered, and the mother, they were divorced, the mother was a nurse, and when she went missing, the mother was working at, uh, as a nurse at that time. And so nobody was home when she went missing. But when she did go missing, she was wearing her bathing suit uh, with just a, like a summer dress over the bathing suit. She had rollers in her hair. And the mother knew that her daughter would not have just run away. Now, at that time in Tucson, there was a lot of runaways. It was a big problem here in Tucson. And so... Quickly, the Tucson police uh, were looking that she was a runaway and believed that she would either pop up somewhere or eventually contact them. And they really were dismissing the idea that she would have been murdered. They believed she ran away. They did do a lot of questioning of all of the, the kids. Charles Schmidt was questioned. Um, everyone pretty much at the school was questioned. But they really did not believe that 
there was anything that happened. They believe she ran away. And so that was very frustrating for the parents. Mm -hmm. Of course. And how long was it before the parents had that, that validation that, yes, she had been murdered? So it wasn't until uh, November. So she was murdered May 31st of 1964. My father went forward to the police November of 1965. And so it wasn't until that time that they knew for sure that something had happened to her. Although I, I think that they did know in their hearts that something that had happened. Of course. And was the pattern of murders the same for all the girls? Well, the two sisters that were murdered, the, the reason Charles Schmidt murdered the sisters was much different. He had, um, shortly after Aline Rowe in May of 1964 was murdered, he met a girl named Gretchen Fritz, who he started dating, and they really fell for each other. He eventually took Gretchen out to the desert where they had buried Aline Rowe and confided in her that he had done this. And he says that he did that because he wanted to see if she would love him no matter what. Well, she kept that secret, but then she started holding it over him. And so she was really kind of blackmailing him with it. If he wasn't home at a certain time, if he didn't do the things that she wanted him to do, she was constantly threatening to go to the police. And so it's believed that that is why he ended up murdering Gretchen was because she just kept threatening to go to the police and he was trying to uh, get rid of that loose end. And then her little sister, Wendy, was with her and was murdered as well. And so he murdered the sisters uh, really for a different reason than he murdered Elaine Rowe. Wow, so this backfired. Uh, I'm, I'm just guessing, you know, trying to think, you know, forensically. You know, he brought her out there, showed her this body to make himself seem, you know, look how powerful I am, look what I've yeah. done. Because in, in preparation for this interview with you, I did a little bit of research on Charles Schmidt, and I, I'm sure that this is probably in your father's works. It, he had a self-image problem. Yeah, he definitely, when my father first met Charles Schmid, he was a very charismatic, good-looking guy. He was always very short. He was 5'3", and so for a man, that's fairly short. But when you see pictures of him uh, without, um, as he evolved, he started wearing lots of makeup and and really doing bizarre things in his style. But if you took that away, he was really a very good-looking, charismatic guy. He was very athletic. He, at the time when my father first met him, he was a uh, gymnast, and he actually led Tucson High School to a championship and was just very, uh, just a strong, good-looking guy and very charismatic. And then over time, as he started getting older, he started to really evolve. He was a big Elvis Presley fan, and he started taking on a real Elvis Presley look, but in a very distorted way. Yes. And so he would wear this pancake makeup and paint this big mole on his cheek that at one point started out really small and kept getting bigger and bigger to the point it was like a quarter size you know, mole <laughs> that he would paint on his face. And then at one point he started wearing a bandage on his nose, and he told people that he broke his nose in a fight. But that bandage, he would just leave on his face, caked with dirt. And it just, he really started to get very odd. And it was clear that he was going through a real identity crisis. And obviously he was, you know, we know that he was a psychopath. We know that he ended up murdering girls. And so we know he was crazy in his mind. But even from an outside perspective, you could see not knowing that he was actually starting to murder people, you could see something was going on with him and he was... These little idiosyncrasies, you know, that, yes. that, that show that my insecurities are starting to make their way out. Um, for example, I've got to mention this just for the comedic value. He began to stretch his lip with a clothespin to look like Elvis? Well, yeah, to get that little... Uh, he, he spent a lot of time, you know, he would dye his chest hairs black and dye his eyebrows and hair black. He, um, he spent a lot of time on his image and, 
And he spent a lot of time, according to my father, looking in the mirror. So he um, he was really self-absorbed. And, you know, he I think when you look at it, he was much older than all the teenagers around him. So he was five years older than my father. And he was about five years older than most all of the kids he hung out with. And so he, you can see how he was getting older and really should have been moving away from all of these teenagers and, and this life with them. And so I think he was really struggling with who is he as a man. And he was having a difficult time because he couldn't, he didn't really have a life away from this teenage following. And so you could see he was truly going through an identity crisis, right. but, um, but also a psychopath. Yeah. And so back to my original point, you know, this, he thought, I'm assuming, was going to be a big boost for his ego. Let me take this girl out here and show her what I've done. Look what I'm capable of doing. But yeah. it completely backfired on him. You know, yeah. now she's got the goods on you, pal. And so he, he's got to get rid of her. But the younger sister is simply collateral damage. Yeah, it's, it's very sad. I mean, when you think about that family losing both of their daughters uh, just like that, they were at a drive-in movie, and nobody really knows how they went from being at that drive-in movie to uh, how, you know, I'm guessing Charles Schmidt maybe had gone to the drive-in movie and found them and convinced them to leave, but uh, they had just gone out to a movie together and never came home. I mean, let's let's look at this um, slide. I, I think it'd be great to kind of move on to your dad's involvement. But mm -hmm. I think, but this is such an unusual scenario because this this guy Charles came from a broken family, very dysfunctional, and that came right through right through his um, his adolescence, etc. And very much right through his life, people could see where this had come from because you can see the identity crisis and all of those things. But in terms of serial killer. Um, status. A serial killer normally has a pattern of behavior and a rationale for killing, and there isn't one here. Once was, I want to experience how this feels to kill, and then that was it. And, and the other times was just coincidental, and of course then you, your, your dad comes into the frame and mm -hmm. prevents a pattern further uh, ongoing. Right. Now, what we don't know is if that fourth girl was murdered by Charles Schmidt. And my understanding is it wasn't too long ago that they actually found uh, remains of what might be that girl. So what we don't know is, was there another victim that he killed for the same reason as Aline Rowe? So there are some questions unanswered in this. But I, but yes, you're right. The, the murders that we know of were pretty obviously for two different reasons. Although he clearly had no issue with killing two more girls, which uh, is, a, is a frightening a frightening thought. Absolutely, but one is deliberate because you want to kill and you want to experience it, and the other one is, I don't want anyone to find out about this. Yes. And there's very much an acknowledgement there of how wrong it was, etc. you can see, because he's trying to claw back and protect himself with killing the next two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when when did he and how did he meet your, your father? So my father met him through a mutual friend. Uh, my father was talking with that mutual friend at a thrifty drugstore here in Tucson. Charles Schmid came in and started talking with them. And then when my father left, he was walking home and Charles Schmid pulled up in his car and asked my father if he wanted to ride home. He accepted the offer. And really, from that point, they started hanging out and becoming uh, close friends. And so they spent a lot of time together. Charles Schmidt, at that point, had already dropped out of high school. He dropped out in his senior year. And my father had dropped out of high school. And so neither one of them was going to school. They didn't have full-time jobs. And so they spent a lot of time just hanging out and, and really just talking a lot. So they became very close from just that, that spending a lot of time every day together. And that's how they met. Um, and then eventually Charles Schmid 
confided in my father about the Aline Rowe murder. And so I really think that for Charles Schmid, it was difficult for him. You mentioned, you know, the, the wanting to, to make himself out to, you know, and show people how strong he is that he, or, or tough he is that he killed someone. But I think, too, it was very difficult for him to just keep quiet. It was very difficult for him to just not, you know, share what he had done. And so um, he ended up confiding in my father, who at the time didn't know that he fully believed it because Charles Schmidt was quite a storyteller and was always telling far-fetched stories. And my father half the time didn't believe some of the stuff that he was saying. Uh, yeah, and, but this time you've got missing kids. Right. Um, the only th And the other thing to keep in mind, and I always like to remind people of the time, um, 1964, 1965, it was before you had evidence like DNA evidence and computer uh, computers that you could follow records and cell phones. And so my father had a story, but he didn't know where the body was. He didn't really know much more than just the story that Charles Schmidt told him. And so he was fearful at that time of going to the police, not knowing, you know, what that could result in because at that point the police had already questioned Charles Schmid. They had already questioned everybody who possibly could have been involved and they had no evidence. And so my father really had no evidence to share either except that Charles Schmid shared the story. And so partly why he didn't go to the police right away is um, he didn't have evidence for the police and wasn't sure how that would result with him. You know, if Charles Schmid was capable of murdering would that put him in danger, too? And so um, so you kind of get a sense that he knew things, but he really didn't know enough that he felt like he could go to the police at that point. How was his relationship with Charles at this point? So with Charles, who? Oh, Charles. So he's confided in him. Your dad's like, okay, I'm not quite sure about this, but um, I haven't got anything really to go on. He's just telling me all this stuff, and it may not even be real. Mm -hmm. What's he noticing about Charles at that point? He and is he, starting to notice... Oh, go ahead. Do you think this is about remorse with Charles, or do you think this is about, um, again, this control and power? Why would he tell your dad? Again, I think it's more about the control and power and wanting to, first of all, not having that ability, for whatever reason, to just keep quiet and really wanting to almost brag is, is how it came across. And at the time... Does it make sense, Lisa, if he has already murdered two girls because they were going to tell people? So when he first confided in my father, the other two girls had not been murdered yet. So okay. when, he, when he first confided in my father, only Aline Rowe had been murdered at, at that point. Okay. And, um, but my father did start noticing the changes happening in Charles Schmidt and his really kind of taking on a, a really – odd look and and really getting odd in the things that he would say and the way he would act. And my father shares a story when he was at Charles Schmidt's home and Charles Schmidt had a cat and he picked up the cat and swung it around by its tail and oh. bat bashed it into a wall. Wow. And so my father yeah, and my father, he Charles Schmidt looked in my father's eyes and asked him, you feel compassion, why? And my father looked in his eyes and could tell he just was not the person that he knew anymore, that he was losing his mind, and he just really quickly got out of there. But from that point forward, my dad started really having a fear of Charles Schmidt and eventually had a reason, too, to believe that Charles Schmidt had his sights on the girl that my father was in love with. And so my father started really becoming obsessed with watching over the girl that he believed Charles Schmidt was going to kill next and felt like he was the only person that was going to be able to protect her. And so that ended up really uh, um, creating a whole nother issue for my father and, and for these cases because uh, my father watched over this girl so much that the girl's family became very concerned and went to the police. And eventually the family was able to get a restraining order and send my father to Columbus, Ohio. But this kind of happened after 
between that time frame, my father found out about Gretchen and Wendy. So there was a span of time where my father was watching over the girl that he thought Charles Schmidt was going to kill next. And then Charles Schmidt ended up killing Gretchen and Wendy. And Charles Schmidt confided that. And those girls, he actually took my father out to see. And that's when my father knew for sure that he had murdered these girls. So this just gets horribly complicated. It's I mean, very complicated. <laughs> he's, he's in so deep now that he feels the responsibility to protect who he assumes is going to be the next victim. Meanwhile, Charles is over here, you know, killing these girls. So at this point, I'm assuming your your father has had enough. What was that infinitesimal moment in time where he said, enough is enough, I'm going to the police? Well, the, the complicated part can, comes in when after Charles Schmidt and, had killed Gretchen and Wendy, and my father, who at that point had been watching over this other girl to make sure that Charles Schmidt is not going near her home, Charles Schmidt convinces my father to come to a party at his home. So my father uh, finally agrees because he feels like if he's with Charles Schmidt, because at that point their friendship had kind of ended, and my father was no longer really spending time with Charles. He was more trying to make sure that he was protecting this girl. Yeah, I wouldn't and, either. I wouldn't want to hang out with him either. Yeah. But he convinces my father to come to this party, and my father feels like, okay, well, as long as he's with Charles Schmidt, he knows the girl is safe. Well, at that party, uh, Charles Schmidt ends up arriving late with two mafia people. And so at that time here in Tucson, the Bonanno family was here, uh, Joe Bonanno, and the two mafia people take Charles Schmidt and my father to an apartment here in Tucson and start questioning them about the girls. Well, my father, who at that point Charles Schmidt had confided in, and he knows that Charles Schmidt, now he's starting to realize, wow, this is like I'm getting way deep into this thing. And so you've got Joe Bonanno's son and uh, another man from the mafia questioning them about this, and, and they basically just kept lying and kept saying they didn't know anything about it. Well, after they got dropped off that night, that's when my father just, you know, was like, what are we going to do? The mafia is involved. And um, Charles Schmidt told my father that the, the scary thing is that he didn't bury the girls, Gretchen and Wendy. saw that as his opportunity and at that time said, if you didn't bury these girls, we need to go out there and bury them. And it was really more calling his bluff. He wanted to know is this really all true? Now he's getting way too deep in this thing. Well, Charles Schmidt does take him out to the bodies, and my father does try to help bury them, although they can't bury them because the ground is too hard. But now Charles Schmidt has my father convinced that he's in this as deep as he is now. So now my father's been to the bodies, he's helped him to try to bury them, and my father is convinced that now he is possibly going to go to prison too. Um, and so that's kind of why he kept it at that point. He was afraid to go to the police because he was now involved in trying to cover it up. But around that same time, the family is that's when he gets the restraining order to be sent to Columbus, Ohio. Once he gets to Columbus, Ohio, within days, he is so panicked that he can't watch over the girl that he believes is going to be the next victim. That's when he calls the police and blows the whole thing. Wow. And then we kind of know where it goes from there. Mm-hmm. I mean, they even brought in F. Lee Bailey to, to consult on this case. Right. F. Lee Bailey had just come off the Sam Shepard cases, which was huge, um, and they believed that uh, he would be able to get Charles Schmid um, this all reversed. Of course, F. Lee Bailey was only out here for a few days, and after spending time with Charles Schmid, he said that, you know, there's no way you're going to get him off. He's a psychopath. And, and they convinced Charles Schmid to plead guilty. Now, later, Charles Schmid tries to claim that he was coerced by F. Lee Bailey. Mm -hmm. And at that time, he convinces them that he, that he knows where the body is, and he'll take them to Aline Rowe's body to show that she was not hit in the head with rocks to prove that their case was wrong. So that's when he takes the police out to the body of Aline Rowe. 
But of course, they do find that her skull was fractured, and so you know his his sentence stands. But it kind of goes to show how you know he he just to take them out to the body to prove that her skull wasn't fractured when it was. You know, he just he was in his own world. But um, but that's when they finally know that Aline Rowe for sure was murdered, and he takes him to the body. Now, I've got to ask this, um, ju- jumping ahead, because we're kind of running up against the clock here. Mm-hmm. Um, we do know that Schmidt did attempt to escape from prison multiple times and was actually successful. At, yes. At, did your father feel like he was in danger at, during these times? Well, actually, the police did feel that he was in danger. So when they did find that he had escaped, they actually took my family, so my father, my mother, and my sisters and I were all put under police protection because there was a belief that he was heading to Tucson. He was actually found in Tucson at a rail yard, which was just down the street from the house that he would have last known my father to be at. But there was a a belief that my father was in danger, and so they did have us under police protection at that time. Now, how did you feel during these times? I was two years old, so I really don't uh. remember too well that I was just a small girl at that time. So I, I don't have any memory of it. But my mother um, tells me that they, it was several days that he was missing. And so uh, the police, they just had us all kind of in the home with police protection. And we weren't able to leave the home or anything during that time. How scary. Yes. And he actually, when they found him, uh, my mother said that they were told that he did have a photograph of my my mother and us kids. So somehow he had gotten a photograph of what she and us look like. So that's a very frightening thought as well. Um, yeah. Did you tell your mother about this. I'm what sorry. Is, what point did your father tell your mother about his connection with Charles? Well, when my father met my mother, this had already been, you know, out in the media. So my mother knew who my father was when she met him. And um, so she knew about it from the from the onset. Okay, cool. Yeah, but she she believed in his innocence. And I mean, to know my father, uh, you know, if, if you know my father and spend any time at all with him, you know that what the media was saying is just not possible. But, you know, it made for a great story because, you know, it was a sensational case as it was. Um, but then on top of that, to try and throw out the story that there was this other person that may have been more involved and, you know, he's trying to turn it around on Charles Schmidt, it makes for an even better media story. And so that's what a lot of the newspapers were running with. Okay. Now we get to my favorite part, the conspiracy. Mm-hmm. What <laughs> what happened to the body? The body of Charles Schmidt? Yes. <laughs> well, I don't know that we know because I I have read myself that they claim that the body is not in the coffin at the Arizona State Prison. But then I've also had people tell me that's just not true. In fact, for the book, we had gone to the Arizona State Prison to take a photo of the gravestone. And I had asked the the person who took us out to the gravestone about that. And she claimed that that is not a truthful story. Um, so I, I don't know. I think, again, I, I don't know unless you actually were to pull up that uh, grave to see if there's really a body in there. And then, you know, my mother and I were talking about the fact that, you know, maybe at a prison there aren't any bodies in those coffins because don't most of the, don't they use them for science and things like that? So I don't have an answer to your conspiracy. I think it's going to continue a conspiracy theory until somebody exhumes the the grave. <laughs> Now, reading through your father's writings, was there ever a point in time that he's like, you know, even before 
he admitted to me about these murders. These behaviors or these circumstances or him doing this should have given me a clue. So according to my father, he didn't start seeing the evolution of Charles Schmidt's personality and all of that happening until after the Elaine Rowe murder. So it was really after he had confided in my father that he started to see that progression happening. And it happened fairly quickly. So this was over the course of really, you know, one year of of him killing Aline Rowe, confiding that in my father, and then really starting to evolve pretty quickly from there. So once he started really seeing that evolution happening, you know, then he did know that something just wasn't right with Charles anymore. This wasn't the, the person that he used to be friends with. And that's when he really started distancing himself from him. But up to that point, up to the first killing, there was nothing that really stood out. It was only after the first killing. So I think maybe that, I think he probably was having those desires to kill. And then once he actually did kill someone, probably then that really caused his mind to just really get deeper and deeper into his psychopathic ways. Now, do we know what led to his death in prison? I mean, we know that he was stabbed to death 40-some-odd times by fellow inmates, but mm -hmm. what, what led to that? Do we know? Well, that's a little bit of a conspiracy there. Um, the two men that murdered him, it really doesn't make a lot of sense that these two guys would have murdered Charles Schmidt because they both were not in there for any type of murder or anything like that, and they both were going to be released within 10 years. And so to murder him, uh, it is believed because of the mafia connection. And just to understand the mafia connection, the, the Fritz sisters that were killed, their father was the heart surgeon for Joe Bonanno. Mm -hmm. And that's the connection to the Fritz family and the mafia connection. So there is a belief that that was probably in the end a mafia hit. Uh, to kill Charles Schmidt for for killing the Gretz, the Fritz sisters, um, but again, there's no real, there's never been a real clear explanation of why they killed Charles Schmidt. Yeah, but it, you know that that makes sense though. Mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. the Bananos were a large family in Tucson. Absolutely. But, so what's next? What What's coming up next for Lisa? I understand that not only do you have this work, but you also, you do seminars? So I do, so I'm an author myself, I, but my seminars are really for, um, I wrote a book on addiction and families who are dealing with addiction. And so that's what I do classes and coaching on. And so I'm continually working with families that are dealing with addiction. Um, and so I've been helping my father with the publicity for the book because he's really trying to, he's unlike most authors. And most authors want to put themselves out there and, and he is really trying to stay out of the spotlight. It took him a long time to gain a level of privacy with still living here in Tucson. And so he's not really wanting to put himself out there, which is very understandable. So with his book, it was just important to us to get his side of the story out there and to finally share that. And um, But the book is getting uh, made into an audio version as well. So there'll be an audio book probably by October is when it's supposed to be done. And so that's coming. And uh, just staying busy. No, oh, absolutely, and please let us know when it comes out on audio. Um, we love audiobooks, and we will also put links up to your book um, or his book uh, right there on our page, somethingweirdmedia.com. Sounds great. Thank you so much. But this has been absolutely fascinating. I, I, I love this. Thank you so much, <laughs> Lisa, for being on with us today. Well, Jillian, Kevin, it was a pleasure to be on with you, and thank you so much for giving us this opportunity to share. Uh, thank you. You are such a, an amazing talker, Lisa. It's, it's oh, been, thank you. 
been very very simple and uh from somebody who obviously in the i, I i'm uk based usually so I, i'm british um so i wouldn't have all of this information and the and the knowledge about the crime scene in the us and you've made it absolutely crystal clear so thank you very much thank you so much now before i let you go lisa is there a version that is released already in on amazon yes yeah, so the book i a squealer is available anywhere books are sold so it's on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, uh you can get it online or at the bookstore itself and it's also available in Kindle and Nook and pretty much anywhere where you buy your books you can get the book now and then uh so the only thing that isn't available yet is the audio version which is to come. Awesome. Well, again, thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much for sharing your father's story with us. And I mean, this has been fascinating, right, Julie? Yeah, amazing. Really good. Thank you so much. To find out more about our show, guests, or to listen to past shows from our archive, please go to www.houseofmysteryradio.com. Show is over for now. Was it as good for you as it was for me? Well, good night. This has been a production of Something Weird Media. I'll be back.